My study was over uh, superconductivity in uh, carbon nanostructures uh, by uh, low field microwave uh, and ESR techniques. All right, next. Uh, so the overview is the measurement techniques, the doping techniques, and our results. So uh, the main thing that we used was the ESR machine. And what it is is it, uh, it applies a magnetic field to the sample. And we pump in microwaves. And using the change in the field, we can detect uh, the vortex oscillations that type 2 superconductors have. Uh, what we look for specifically was type 2 superconductors. Uh, you can kind of think of them like Swiss cheese. Uh, whereas a regular superconductor, uh, when it's exposed to magnetic field, the lines will uh, attempt to penetrate and be repelled. But in a type 2 superconductor, it'll go through small vortices. And by using microwaves, we can detect their oscillations and detect superconductivity. Um, the reason why we use the uh, low field microwave absorption was it can uh, detect the oscillations in the type 2 superconductors. And it's a very precise measurement. It's, um, it can detect an extremely small portion of the uh, superconductor, up to 10 to the negative 11 centimeters cubed. And it uses low fields to detect the uh, vortices so it doesn't damage the sample and destroy superconductivity. All right. Uh, Another uh, technique we used was the uh, electron spin resonance. What this is, is we use a higher magnetic field while it's under the uh, microwave. So it can detect the uh, difference in energy levels. And we kind of used it like a, um, a form of spectro uh, spectroscopy. Uh, and because certain materials have certain ESR signatures, we can tell if something's being doped and what it's made out of. Uh, the kind of doping that we did uh, personally was uh, intercalation doping. And what this is, is we would, uh, here, click it. Uh, we would have our sample in a, uh, in a vacuum seal, and we'd have the doping material, which would be an uh, alkali metal like uh, potassium. And then we would expose it to heat to uh, cover the surface of it in a mirror around it. Next. So what this would be able to do is when we heat it up, it'll vaporize some of the alkali metals, and then they'll be intercalated into our sample. Uh, Next. In, in order to uh, do this, we'd have a two-zone furnace, and we'd have the sample at one end, and we'd have the uh, doping material at the other. And by exposing the doping material to a slightly higher temperature, it would cause some of the vapors to intercalate, but it wouldn't cause the uh, actual material to like liquefy and uh, deposit on there, because that's not what we wanted. Thanks. Uh, we also tested samples from other labs and their doping techniques. Uh, we tested uh, some samples from the University of Houston that were doped by ion injection with boron. And we also t uh, tested uh, electrochemically double-layered charging that was uh, done at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, some of the results. The main focus of our research was the uh, semiconducting single-walled carbon nanotubes versus the metallic single-walled carbon nanotubes and how they reacted to doping. And we saw that there weren't any signs of superconductivity yet, but the semiconducting carbon nanotubes were better doped or uh, more readily doped than the metallic uh, single-walled carbon nanotubes. These are the uh, results that we got. Uh, as you can tell, the semiconducting and the metallic are virtually like, identical in the regular ESR scan when, out the, when they're not doped. But after we dope them, you can tell that there's this uh, peak in the semiconducting. And that's uh, the result that we get from it being doped. And in the metallic, you can't really see anything until you, we dope it even further. And the uh, peak in the semiconducting is even greater, while the peak in the metallic, you have to zoom in. You can tell that the field is a lot smaller, and uh, it's a lot less intense. And uh, we got positive results from boron-doped carbon nanotubes from the University of Houston. Uh, what, what you see here is the hysteresis that you get. So 
whenever something is superconducting, but we weren't able to find that in the samples that we made, but we were able to find this from the uh, samples from the University of Houston at four degrees Kelvin. Uh, conclusion, uh, while we were not able to detect superconductivity in the samples that we made from the semiconducting and the metallic nanotubes, we were able to see that the doping worked better with the single walled uh, carbon nanotubes that were semiconducting and not metallic. Um, right now, it's just like a proof of concept almost because we we're trying to see if it if it will superconduct and if it works and if it does, then it'll be researched further and it'll become more effective and better. So, you got to start somewhere. Any more questions about David work? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I have a question about uh, the doping process uh, when you dope the nanotubes. Mm -hmm. So, where the dope uh, doping goes, uh, it's go between. Uh, uh, it, it intercalates into the, uh, ideally it would intercalate into the carbon nanotubes, so it would uh -huh. be, be placed within them and it would provide electrons for the superconductivity. Okay, thank you. So, okay, if uh, we have no more questions, then thanks David again. Right. <laughs>